As I was preparing to come here from my home um, on the other side of the country, the first thing that happened when I woke up this morning was that my three-year-old daughter demanded, as she always does, that I read her a story. And um, just so happens that on a trip to the library the previous day, we picked up a copy of Dr. Seuss's classic book, The Lorax. So the first book that I read this morning was um, The Lorax. I don't know how many have, of you have read that classic work of conservation, but as I read through it, um, I started thinking uh, uncontrollably about the event um, which I was coming to speak at, uh, which I'm speaking at now, and about the kind of gulf that separates us from the time in which Dr. Seuss was, was writing. If you, if you don't recall, the basic storyline of the Lorax is that um, a kind of evil capitalist figure called the Onceler comes to a beautiful place with lovely multicolored trees and begins chopping them down to make useless stuff which he markets to people. And in doing that, he displaces the local um, inhabitants, the barbaloots, who are sort of vaguely um, bear-looking creatures, the swomi swans, and the hummingfish, and they, they all leave. Um, and each time that they are, um, uh, these different animals are being displaced, the Lorax, this kind of guardian figure of the, um, of the area appears and says to the Wunstler, you've got to stop doing this, um, otherwise everyone is going to leave. Uh, and eventually, since the Wunstler doesn't listen to him and keeps producing this useless stuff in order to make more and more buckets of money, the Lorax himself picks himself up by his britches and transports himself through a hole in the smoggy clouds which have come to cover the area. Uh, and so everyone goes to different pastures. Um, and it occurred to me that we live in such a different time because back when the Lorax was written, it was possible to imagine environmental catastrophe as something that was relatively localized, right? You know, the, the Lorax is forest gets chopped down and all the f uh, animals get displaced somewhere else and eventually the Lorax goes somewhere else too. Today, of course, the environmental crisis is, is global um, and while it manifests with more intensity in one place or another, nonetheless, what we're really contemplating is planetary ecocide. So we can no longer imagine the idea of just picking ourselves up by our britches and you know, jetting through some hole in the clouds to a better place. Um, and that is quite terrifying, obviously. Um, uh, what I argue in my book is that the places in which the greatest numbers of people are concentrated and the greatest uh, uh, percentage of natural disasters strike home are cities, and particularly megacities um, in the global south, uh, as well as um, large cities in the global north, so that the city itself becomes a kind of ground zero for climate change. Um, and I'm going to go into some of the specific characteristics of those cities. Um, <clears throat> so those are the, that's the specific local ground. It's a planetary emergency, and it's easy to give in to a kind of apocalypticism. Um, but I think we need to be careful. We need to acknowledge the challenges which we're confronted with without giving in to complete catastrophic feelings because there's a danger that that kind of catast uh, catastrophism can be used, particularly by right-wing forces. Um, it can be turned towards a kind of Malthusian xenophobia. Um, so what I'm going to try to do tonight is to present you with some of the uh, really um, very upsetting information about the way in which cities are um, a particularly important site where climate change is playing out, and then also talk to you about some of the things that are being done on urban terrain to try and cope with this reality. So I'll start out with some of the um, very upsetting information. This is a report that was released only a couple of weeks ago um, about extreme changes that are going on in Antarctica. Um, as you will know, Antarctica and Greenland are the two places where really significant glaciers are based in land. Um, the uh, Arctic, which is melting very fast, of course, um, uh, is melting into seawater, and consequently the uh, disappearance of Arctic ice is not producing uh, an increase in sea level. 
uh, in Antarctica and in Greenland, the glaciers are melting and flowing directly off the land masses and into surrounding seas. Uh, and so what recent scientific analysis is suggesting is that the projections by bodies like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change for uh, expected rates of sea level rise are definitely low ball, right? So the IPC was, uh, PCC was projecting up to six feet by the end of the century. Um, it looks like we're gonna get a lot more according to this report and that it's not gonna be in some kind of even um, uptick but rather in uh, very quick uh, uh, increases of melting followed by plateaus. And as more and more energy is pumped into the atmosphere as a result of global warming, the likelihood that these higher seas are gonna produce um, uh, intense forms of flooding in cities is increased. In fact, um, last fall, in the middle of uh, the devastating hurricane season, uh, in the Western Hemisphere, and right before the meeting of the United Nations Climate Summit in Bonn in Germany, um, the Guardian newspaper produced a report analyzing projections for the impact of sea level rise on major cities around the world. Uh, and the interesting and alarming thing about the report was it was saying, this is what we've got happening if we were going to stick to the amount of agreed upon um, uh, emissions at Paris two years before. The thing was, as came out in the course of last fall's UN meeting, the major industrialized powers of the world are far overshooting their promises two years ago. So what the Guardian report was highlighting is actually again kind of lowballing things. But let's just stick with what the Guardian mentioned. I hope you can read this, um, it says, hundreds of millions of urban dwellers around the world face their cities being inundated by rising seawaters. Um, that's roughly about uh, 500 million people in major cities, and they list some of the cities, including Shanghai, Alexandria, et cetera, et cetera, and of course, uh, Miami and New Orleans. In fact, as they say in that middle paragraph, the bottom third of Florida is likely to be inundated by 2100, um, and of course, inundation is already happening around Miami uh, right now. It's not that we have to wait until 2100 for all of these things to happen. And the other part of the report, which you can see in that final um, paragraph that was, I think, very important, was the suggestion that f many cities are really very, very unprepared and little is being done. What I'm gonna talk about in a little while is the kinds of steps that have been taken and what the kind of cutting edge efforts to think about adaptation in cities are. But first, before I talk about that, I also I want to talk about the ways in which, in addition to being victims of climate change, cities are also perpetrators of climate change. Cities are responsible for about 70% of carbon emissions, globally speaking. Um, that has to do, of course, with the impact of the, the built fabric, transportation um, in the cities, industry in cities, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But of course, it's quite hard to see this since carbon emissions are relatively invisible. So how do we make the uh, role of cities um, apparent? Well, during the Bloomberg administration, there was an interesting attempt to visualize the impact of New York City uh, through the creation of these uh, computer images in which one ton of carbon emissions generated by the city would be visualized through a 33-foot diameter balloon. And so here you can see a New York City street uh, with some of these balloons rising up into the atmosphere. To give you a bit of a sense of how this uh, is impacting the planet, here's one hour of New York City's carbon emissions stacked up next to the Empire State Building. You can see it's about half the size of the Empire State Building. And of course, it's in a pyramid shape. Pretty dramatic, but not nearly as dramatic as one day of carbon emissions. Um, a, a truly 
tremendous amount of emissions. Um, and of course, not all cities emit as much as New York City. New York City is particularly concentrated. And of course, uh, if we were to think beyond the geographical bounds of New York City and start thinking about Wall Street and capitalism and the role of New York in terms of uh, being the center and linchpin of the global capital system, maybe we should imagine that pile much higher. But um, it was an effort at least to think about the culpability of cities. Uh, if cities are culpable, and if we know they're going to be very, very hard hit by um, climate change, why do we keep building in such vulnerable places? This is an article from about two years ago from Scientific American where they somewhat naively ask, you know, why um, uh, is there continued construction along threatened coastlines uh, when we know that seas are rising? And appropriately enough, they picked Miami Beach. Uh, as the image that went along with this article. Um, I write in my book about Miami in general, but Miami Beach is one of the most threatened places on the planet. Um, because of its li porous limestone foundation, it means you can't build any kind of a seawall or a barricade to stop the waters coming in. They'll just go underneath. In fact, the city is afflicted at the moment by king tides when you know strong rain means that the incursion of salt waters produces these um, swells of water that come up through the sewers and you get manholes kind of popping off and water flooding neighborhoods. So these issues are, are a problem right now, not in some uh, future date like 2100. Well, to answer the question of Scientific American, and of course Scientific American um, doesn't tackle the question as directly as I would like to see it tackled, I think one has to think about the role of capital and urbanization. So cities are really sites today where the global capitalist system parks its over-accumulated assets, right? We, over the last 40 years or so, the dominant trend of uh, capitalism has been towards um, financialization in the developed parts of the world, but intimately linked to financialization um, and the forms of speculation that are connected to it has been certain forms of urbanization, right? So building out the urban fabric as a way of parking all of this over-accumulated capital of the 1%. Um, in fact, in cities like New York and no doubt Seattle too, there are many empty luxury apartments sitting there because of the need to keep um, uh, finding a kind of spatial fix for capital in the city. If you look at a map of the world's most threatened cities, this is one produced a couple of years ago by the OECD, in fact you can kind of see how the history of capitalism over the last half century maps onto the world's most imperiled cities. And you can see that some of them are in obvious places like New York and Miami and New Orleans, but then a lot of the places with the largest uh, amounts of imperiled economic assets are in East Asia, which of course is where capital uh, in the developed world has outsourced labor. Um, and so it's been the site of the development of a whole you know, slew of mega cities along the coastal littoral in China and other parts of East and South Asia. And this is just an image of imperiled uh, economic assets, we could also come up with an image of imperiled human populations, which would very much dovetail with this. Now, if we're thinking about cities, though, and how they're threatened, it's also Im very important not to think about cities as homogenous. And there's a tendency uh, not only to ignore cities in terms of their impact in climate change, right? When we think about climate change, we tend to think about kind of the global scale, right? Or else like national contributions, that's how carbon emissions tend to be talked about. You know, we talk about the, the US um, contribution to emissions um, on an annual basis. We seldom talk about cities, um, so it's really important uh, some of the efforts to image um, the responsibility for cities that I already showed you is very, very important. But nonetheless, there's a tendency to think about cities as unified units, um, even in those uh, efforts to make cities visible. But that's a problem. Cities are not unified at all, of course. Um, and it's enough just to mention galloping economic inequality to be aware of that. Of course, cities are very, very much stratified by income and uh, by race. Uh, New York City I, is particularly strong example of this because 
um, of the way in which capital is very much concentrated in Manhattan, in places like Midtown and the Downtown Financial Center. And then there's a, a kind of ring of uh, in the outer boroughs and even more distant suburbs of working class people uh, and people of color who are servicing capital and traveling in and out to the, the urban center. Um, and what I'm showing you right now as I speak is an image of energy consumption that really ma makes the economic disparities within the city quite visible. So. You can see that on the left-hand side, that's Manhattan, with, of course, the big green rectangle being uh, Times, uh, sorry, Central Park. Um, and the areas to the right are in the top, um, Queens, and beneath that, parts of Brooklyn. And uh, the, the dark red areas and orange areas are the areas with highest energy consumption and consequently highest carbon emissions. So you can see that not surprisingly, the Midtown um, uh, Financial Center and Wall Street are the areas that have the highest energy consumption. But it's not just the kind of gleaming skyscrapers of those financial uh, areas, but also wealthy residential areas like the West Village. So basically the kind of urban 1% are very much responsible for disproportionate economic uh, consumption, energy consumption, and carbon emissions within the city. And this image, I think, very much maps that. Not surprisingly, the image um, also corresponds fairly closely to areas that are threatened by flooding. And here we have the New York City hurricane evacuation zones. Um, if you remember Hurricane Sandy, you'll remember that the downtown area, the Wall Street area, was flooded. And you can see that from the kind of red um, circle which surrounds the bottom of Manhattan. But you'll notice that much more of New York City that's red is in the outer boroughs, including most of all southern Brooklyn um, and eastern Queens, which again are populations that are poor, um, and predominantly people of color. So the areas of the city that are most threatened are also the areas of the city that consume the least, that produce the least emissions, and that are, are uh, poorest. And of course, this structure of the city is reflected on a global level, right? The people who are most threatened by climate change are the people who are least responsible for climate change in terms of their emissions per capita today, and then of course historically. Um, uh, uh, these are the people of the global south in general. So, right, the kind of global dynamic of climate change and the social inequality that uh, is reflected in climate change is also apparent within specific cities, even the glo in the global north. And this dynamic was very much apparent when Hurricane Sandy struck. Um, one of the things that uh, was, I think, very important um, about the response to Hurricane Sandy was that it came one year after Occupy Wall Street, which focused so much attention on the 1% and on the economic disparities within New York City. So the, the response to Hurricane Sandy in the form of Occupy Sandy, which I write about in the book, was a kind of grassroots, horizontalist, community-led effort very much tried to put resources into areas of the city, those areas that you saw previously that were the poorest and that had not been supported uh, by um, both urban authorities historically, but also by FEMA and other disaster response um, units when Hurricane Sandy hit. So it's very important to talk about efforts to challenge the ways in which disaster relief tends to play out on an uneven urban terrain and often to reinscribe those inequalities, right, by trying to restore a situation uh, back to the way it was prior to a disaster, um, even though that situation was one of marked inequality and environmental injustice. And of course, that same kind of dynamic is playing out in Puerto Rico most clamorously today as another hurricane season begins and power continues to, to go out across the island of Puerto Rico. Uh, in the book, I talk about the ways in which New York responded to Sandy through quite novel efforts to adapt the city to forthcoming catastrophes. One of the examples that I talk about was the Re Rebuild by Design competition. This was um, uh, an effort to bring together teams of landscape architects, 
urban planners, engineers, and even sociologists and anthropologists to look at the communities that had been most adversely impacted by Hurricane Sandy, to go into them, to find out what people wanted, and to come up with proposals for how to adapt those areas to future uh, impacts of uh, climate change similar to Hurricane Sandy. There were five major award-winning designs as part of the competition. Um, there were many other proposals, and you can go on the Rebuild by Design website if you're interested in looking at the whole suite of proposals. I talk about the five major award-winning proposals. The one that got the most money was called the Big U. The reason for that name is fairly apparent if you look at the proposal. It's essentially the idea was to create a kind of uh, berm or seawall or dike or whatever you want to call it, some kind of uh, a breakwater that is in a U shape from West 42nd Street all the way down uh, around Battery Park, which you see in the bottom of the image here, and then back up the east side to 42nd Street. Um, pretty evidently just to prevent a storm surge along the lines of Hurricane Sandy from uh, inundating the bottom part of Manhattan again. Now, there's a lot of community feedback, particularly from communities which had been uh, ignored during the previous disaster reconstruction effort after 9-11. Um, following the attacks that demolished the World Trade Centers, a lot of federal and uh, city funding had gone into the downtown, but it had pretty much completely ignored working class neighborhoods, uh, particularly Chinatown and the Lower East Side, which um, are predominantly populated by um, people of color. So the community mobilization that resulted from that history meant that when the Rebuild by Design teams began thinking about what to design, they had a very militant community response saying there has to be some element of community support and input into your design. And you can see that here. Um, the seawall was essentially made wide enough that it could become a, a park and a series of other kind of recreational facilities for communities that are very much starved of access to green space. And this might sound like a, a relatively unimportant thing. Um, uh, Seattle is a very green city, so I'm sure you have parks all over the place. But in a place like the Lower East Side, getting access to a park is hugely important, particularly since these areas are also places where um, people have extremely high rates of asthma. So you know, having green space is extremely important uh, on a very immediate corporeal level. The, one of the other proposals that I think is particularly interesting, which was part of the award-winning um, designs for Rebuild by Design, uh, was the Living Breakwaters proposal by Scape Studio. Uh, this was for Staten Island for the East Coast, which got inundated and quite a few people died. Um, I had students, because I teach at the College of Staten Island, whose families were displaced um, after communities along the seaboard were flooded. What um, the Living Breakwaters did proposal uh, did that was particularly interesting was that instead of saying we're just going to create a seawall, um, uh, they proposed breakwaters. Why is a breakwater preferable to a seawall? The problem with a seawall is that um, it tends to only be a certain height. And as I showed you at the beginning of my presentation, um, uh, tides are rising all the time. So you can inadvertently give a people a feeling of safety. They'll build right behind a seawall and then it can be overtopped, it can fail catastrophically. And of course, from uh, Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, we know what the implications of one of those kinds of failures are. So a breakwater doesn't try to keep the water out entirely, it just tries to cut the strength of the storm surge um, and make people aware that it might be coming, but prevent it from being quite as catastrophic as it might otherwise be. The other uh, two elements of the proposal that I think are particularly interesting and forward thinking, um, one of them includes making a kind of um, uh, multi-species site of habitation for the breakwater. So instead of it just being um, a kind of concrete breakwater, Scape Studio proposes um, creating uh, oyster habitat on the breakwater. And the idea is to create a kind of oyster reef that will grow as the waters themselves get higher. Uh, and the, the oyster beds will act as part of the, the breakwater. And in addition to that, the oysters will hopefully be part of um, a vibrant sea 
based community of humans interacting with the oysters. So um, the proposal included local hubs for connecting people to knowledge about the uh, aquatic environment um, and also of course for trying to get people to harvest and to tend to the living breakwaters um, as a site of uh, education and also potentially economic vitalization for coastal communities. So I think there's a real recognition of the ways in which human beings have to live in relation to these uh, protective infrastructures and the way in which these infrastructures have to include a living component uh, and to kind of incorporate nature um, rather than just being about engineering. Uh, so I think that's what marks these pretty interesting innovations. However, there are quite significant limits to them and I think those become apparent when one begins to look at uh, really grassroots up proposals for adaptation. And in the book I talk um, about the proposal from We Act, which is a Harlem-based environmental justice organization which proposed a plan for northern Manhattan, uh, which is quite multifaceted. You can go on the web and read about it in more detail. I'm just going to highlight very quickly three different elements of it. One had to do with community-based power. So um, on uh, in both senses of the term of power, right? So part of it is to create uh, uh, solar-powered microgrids, and this is going to add to resilience of the community. Uh, one of the things which I'm sure you will remember, um, when Hurricane Sandy struck Manhattan, it inundated um, a breaker system and knocked out generation for pretty much all of Manhattan south of about 30th Street. So for a week or two, there was no power in much of downtown. Uh, and there were these dramatic images of New York lit up with uh, uh, all of its lights at night and just complete darkness south of 30th Street. So it's very important to have this community-based microgrid so that if the rest of the grid crashes, um, people will be able to have power. And this is particularly important in a city like New York, which has people living in um, uh, quite high buildings because our famous Catskills-based water supply only goes up to the fifth floor based on natural pressure. Above the fifth floor, if you don't have electricity, you don't have any water. So not only is it a case when the electricity goes out that you, you might not have heat, your elevators might not be working, but also you won't have um, any water. It becomes a, a real life and death issue, um, particularly for vulnerable populations. So this is one really important element of the WE Act proposal. And in addition to having power in the kind of electrical sense of the term, the microgrid is also going to be able to put power back into the rest of the grid and by doing that generate economic resources for the community. And of course, uh, with the need to maintain uh, the microgrid, uh, well-paying jobs and employment in the community, right? So it's power in a quite developed sense of the term. One of the other elements of the proposal has to do with dealing with the heat island effect. Um, I've been talking a lot about flooding and inundation, but the thing that kills the most people in cities and probably will continue to do so in the, in the future as climate change bites deeper is uh, heat problems in cities and the kind of combination of, of heat and um, uh, bad uh, air. Uh, so in order to cope with that, we really need to green cities as much as possible. Um, we Act proposes creating community gardens which would help to green the city, but which would also deal to a certain extent with the problem of food deserts in working class and communities of color, um, where there aren't good uh, grocery stores in many cases, um, and would also again provide a source of revenue for local communities. And then the final element of their proposal, which I'd like to highlight, is the idea of social centers or social hubs, right? Because one of the things that we've come to understand by studying disasters in cities is that the difference between life and death often has to do with whether you know your neighbors. In other words, it has to do with the, the thickness of your social networks. This is really important because when you start to hear people talking about resiliency, it's often, the conversation is often dominated by engineers and other people who are thinking about resiliency in terms of, of the, the infrastructure, you know. Is the electrical system going to crash when the temperature goes above a certain level? That's all very, very important, but it's really, really crucial to think about how to 
maintain social contacts and to strengthen those kinds of contacts. So what we ACT proposes is these social centers which people could uh, repair to, which they could take refuge in during a natural disaster so that you know these would be places that would have solar panels that would be able to keep electricity going if uh, the grid crashed, um, that would be in an elevated area um, so that they would be very important during a time of natural disaster, but they'd also be open to the communities year-round. So on a kind of quotidian basis, they could become a site for building community and the kind of thick social fabric that we've come to learn is absolutely essential to survival. And that sort of takes me back to what I was saying about Occupy Sandy, right, and the way that they used sort of horizontalist networks. When FEMA and uh, the city government weren't available, it was communities engaging in mutual aid that really help people survive. These are all really, really important examples of kind of cutting edge adaptation to climate change in cities. And we could go through many examples in, in other cities and think about the ways in which cities in the global south, for instance, have very developed social networks, even if they don't have some of the uh, developed infrastructure. Um, so they often get seen as sites of particular disaster uh, from uh, a kind of biased perspective in the global north in a way that is not necessarily true. But um, I think in addition to thinking about adaptation, we also have to admit the need for retreat. As I said, um, by the end of the century, most of the world's major cities are going to be flooded, um, and some uh, portions of those cities are going to have to be abandoned, either partially uh, for some time or you know, permanently, and in some cases, cities like New Orleans and um, Miami, as inconceivable as it might be today, those cities are gonna to have to be evacuated totally. So how do we confront questions of retreat and ensure that it's not just the wealthy 1% who can afford to abandon property or to sell it and move to other properties which um, they have the economic means to access? These are questions which really aren't discussed very much in the public sphere uh, in the US today. You know, we have a kind of macho imperialist discourse of you know, building it back and these colors won't run. And um, you know, beginning to talk about these things is very, very hard, both because of kind of public discourse, but also because of some of the, the, the structures through which we operate, right? You know, we have, for instance, a national flood insurance program which pays people to rebuild their houses um, rather than to actually move them to other places. It was originally designed to help people move away from threatened places, but the way it operates today is essentially to subsidize the, the most wealthy to rebuild their second or third houses. So um, there's also a kind of institutional um, crisis and contradiction that we need to confront. So where are these kinds of conversations about just retreat happening? Well, they're beginning to filter through to some um, design and urban planning circles. Um, as I was thinking about these questions, I came across a report um, by the Urban Land Institute about um, northern Miami, which, as I said earlier, is one of the world's most threatened cities. So they talk about a, a portion of the city which is repeatedly flooded. They talk about the way in which development in the 20th century took place completely irregardless of the natural landscape so that you know, houses were built in areas where the topography was quite low-lying, where there were underground aquifers, and consequently where flooding was going to become uh, more and more of a problem. So the Urban Land Institute confronts that question and says, what can we do? Well, what we should do is to buy out repeatedly flooded uh, properties and create some kind of a parkland. They use a kind of endearing, uh, endearingly anachronistic term, a, s a slow or slew, um, <laughs> which uh, any of you who've read Pilgrim's Progress from the 18th century, that's sort of where you know, the sinner ended up. But they don't mean it that way. They mean it kind of as a place that can be a public amenity, you know, a park, um, when it's not raining heavily, or flooding, um, and then when the floods come, water will collect there, and it will not home, uh, harm homes or uh, people as a result. Of course, the big question is, where will the people who live there now go? Um, well, Urban Land Institute proposes, and I'm sorry, you probably can't read very much of this because of how far away from you it is, but they propose offering residents of these areas first dibs on affordable housing built uh, further inland along the kind of re elevated spine of land that goes down the center of the Florida Peninsula. So um, affordable housing, 
that is going to be developed in a way that means that it will be relatively um, light in terms of its carbon emissions, you know, connected to uh, a transit line, um, a public transit line down the center of uh, the, the peninsula. Um, this is still a proposal. It'll be interesting to see how it goes. Um, the Urban Land Institute has a problematic history, though. Um, after Hurricane Katrina, they worked with the Bring New Orleans Back um, Commission to propose similar kinds of schemes for New Orleans. Basically, as you can see here, those kind of green circles, they proposed creating these kind of sloughs or parks that could absorb um, floodwaters if the levees burst again. But what they proposed back after Katrina was that the people living in those areas be dispossessed by giving the city right to eminent domain so that people's houses could just be taken away. And this raised a real hue and cry. People saw it as an extension of racist policies that have dominated the city of New Orleans for many, many decades. And so uh, the proposal was eventually um, uh, stepped away from by Mayor Nagan. Um, which was a huge victory for struggles of communities of color in the city on one level, but on another level, you know, there are people living in areas that are likely to be flooded once again um, in the not too distant future. So uh, we also have to really think about these conversations about just retreat um, and uh, about environmental justice much more deeply and through much deeper forms of consultation with threatened communities if we're not going to have this kind of thing, you know, imagining the rebuilt city in terms of greening uh, the wealthy financial districts um, and doing it with a kind of white male hand um, rather than through any kind of um, forms of environmental justice. Uh, the last thing that I want to talk about, in addition to issues of adaptation and retreat, is to go back to mitigation. I mean, for a long time it was taboo to even talk about adaptation, right, because we wanted to only think about mitigation and how we diminish carbon emissions. The argument of my book is that we can't talk about that alone anymore, but I want to close by saying that we do have to think about cities as crucibles of the struggle for um, mitigation and um, that they are, in fact, proving to be sites for thinking about just transition and sites for struggle against fossil capital specifically. Um, in the New York region, this is particularly important. Um, you can see here a map of pipelines. And of course, um, not too far away from New York City is the Marcellus Shale, which is the site of the greatest expansion of fracking that's going on in the United States today. And you can see uh, the number of pipelines uh, in the left-hand side there really gives you a sense of the extent of um, fracking and um, new infrastructure for um, so-called natural gas, which is actually methane. But then you can see some of the pipelines that are moving all of that east towards um, uh, urban areas like Philadelphia and New York, and then of course beyond uh, onto transfer terminals and boats heading for the European Union. So there's a real struggle going on right now in the New York uh, region to stop this fossil fuel infrastructure because of course we know that we can have no new fossil fuel um, uh, infrastructure if we're going to prevent catastrophic climate change. You know, we have to shut down all the existing coal mines and a lot of the existing oil and natural gas um, mines if we are going to avoid catastrophic climate change. And we certainly can have more of this stuff. So um, we really have a huge fight on our hands. Um, New York City, I'm very pleased as you probably know, has actually had quite a signal victory recently with the announcement back in January by Mayor Bill de Blasio that the city would be divesting its pension funds from fossil fuels from and suing the top five big oil corporations. And of course, the mayor's announcement came after many years of uh, really militant struggle by environmental justice organizations, housing rights organizations, and uh, many other uh, groups, including um, uh, labor 
on the ground in New York City. And it's a signal victory, but of course we need to think about how to push this victory further because divestment is going to take some time and we really don't have much time. So what's happening in New York, the kind of cutting edge of this struggle is being advanced by this coalition called New York Renews, which is composed of some of the same groups that were behind divestment. So it's a real kind of coalitional effort. Um, and there are two major prongs which we're fighting to push right now through the New York State Legislature. Um, one is this uh, Climate and Community Protection Act, which as you can see is very much a, a move to mandate that the city move towards completely carbon-free uh, um, economy very quickly by 2050 at the latest, um, although you'll see that there's also uh, earmarking of 40% of the funds for communities that are disadvantaged in various different ways, and that sort of middle element is developed in much more detail by the second major legislative initiative which New York Renews Coalition is pushing, and that's the polluter pays um, uh, bill, which you can see here about thir a, th a third of the revenue is for um, creating climate jobs and new renewable energy infrastructure, a third is for a just transition fund that's completely targeted to disadvantaged communities. Um, uh, and then another third is for a rebate fund so that the big oil companies can't just pass the costs of the tax on to um, poor people and working class people. And then the final section, which is the second from the right column, is 7% of revenue devoted to people working in fossil fuel jobs right now, right? We need to bring those communities along, and that's particularly important in moving labor, which in New York State is very, very important to support this uh, drive. So I think this is really the cutting edge um, and is being advanced by some of the same organizations that are pushing very forward-thinking uh, adaptation um, and just transition conversations. Um, I'll close with a slide from the Empire State Building. It was lit up green the day after Mayor Bill de Blasio's announcement of divestment, and I think it holds out the hope that cities, in addition to being drivers of climate change and victims of climate change, can also be sites where the struggle for social justice and environmental justice uh, and uh, for the future takes place. Thanks very much, everyone. Uh, I would suggest that um, uh, market solutions are, are doomed in this scenario. Uh, be, first, because um, uh, capital has an imperative to grow. And uh, even if this uh, energy is coming from renewable sources, capital is still going to uh, go full speed ahead to deplete the resources of our society, of our planet in order to accumulate more and more capital. And uh, the, other, the other point is that the solutions that you pointed out, for example, of, of retreat, these are the people, the people who are being asked to go to affordable housing will presumably be displaced by eminent domain, they will be given a certain amount of money, perhaps for that loss, and be asked to move to, um, uh, to affordable housing. Housing th th for a situation that they had nothing to do with for the most part, and they're going to have to foot the bill. And so it seems to me the only solution that we have is some sort of planned economy where we try to figure out what's the best way to proceed here uh, uh, that we can actually salvage our uh, our, our race and, uh, and the species on the planet. And I, they, uh, the last, I'd like to leave my comments with two words to see if that, um, uh, to, to emphasize the point. And those two words are Scott Pruitt. <laughs> okay, um, should, we, should we take a couple of questions? Okay, so uh, last week I read a uh, uh, part of an interview with a, uh, uh, or scientists in uh, the UK who has predicted kind of the, the, the path that we're taking. And he suggests that actually by 2100, uh, it's questionable whether uh, they'll be, uh, we'll be able to support humanity 
with what's left of the planet. Okay, and he po posits a couple of things that I think are very interesting. He says, if you want to impact climate, you stop having kids. Okay, he says that's the biggest driver of, uh, of global warming that's not talked about, uh, population growth. He says, actually, we need to have a negative population growth. And he doesn't see this happening anytime soon, even by 2100. And it, it, this is a practical question for me, okay? Do I devote, uh, I'm retired, I'm a senior, I've spent all my life in the struggle uh, for social justice, against war. Uh, do I spend the next 20 years of my life fighting for something that's not attainable using these methods when the methods that we're going to need to reverse this are really um, outside of our cur current economy and even our current consciousness. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, I, I don't know that. I, I, I know that in, in uh, the highly developed capitalist countries, the, the birth rate is lower than in some other parts of the world. But uh, if we're going to get to a negative population growth, uh, I can think of two things. Uh, genocide. Okay, or uh, some really radical change in the way, not, not just our thinking, but how we're prepared to live our lives to achieve those massive drops in, in carbon uh, emissions. Right, right. Yeah, okay, thank you. I think it's very interesting if you look at the parallel problem that you brought up in the beginning about the overaccumulation of capital and parking it in the central cities now, mm -hmm. where it goes, some of which are going to be inundated, but most of the people with capital are going to find ways uh, to take the Malthusian solution that they are going to propose and, and uh, present it as some sort of ecologically sound conclusion, as, as Jeff Mann points out. Uh, there's a lifeboat, we're going to have to put people outside it, and guess what? It's going to be the people in the outer boroughs, you know? But when we discuss the problem in Seattle now of rising rents and the displacement of people, people, people being displaced not by a natural disaster, but, by, but something that is treated as a natural disaster, the fact that all this overaccumulated capital is seeking real estate in all the cities of the world and is driving up everything, and yet the discussion is still presented on the notion of uh, a question of supply and demands. It's the people who are pushing for zoning, who are really holding it back. And if you upzone and let developers build what they have, it's bound to produce so much more uh, available space that the rents are going to come down and everything will be all right. At the same time, there are newspaper articles every day in Seattle that say, uh, you won't be able to live in Seattle when you retire, but here are some nice places like Cleveland you can move to that you right. can afford. In other words, a whole population is being told, you know what, get ready to leave. You know, be right. resilient, you know, and let these wealthier people who have been paid more come in and enjoy the city that you thought was your home for 40 years. So, I mean, this is the same as the displacement issue that the people didn't want to go in New Orleans, but the key initial issue is how do we subtract the 1% from the we, and then get the other we, the rest of us, to put conflict at the center of what we're proposing. That's the OK, great. Thank you. Um, great questions. Um, well, you know, um, mobilizing people and making the struggles clear is you know, what I'm really trying to do in the book. Um, uh, there is a section basically at the very outset of the book where I talk about Bloomberg's New York, you know. We'd had horribly kind of neo-fascist mayors like Rudy Giuliani, you know, uh, quality of life, uh, you know, mayor who um, really took homeless people off the streets violently during his reign. And so for some people, Bloomberg was a welcome relief. You know, he uh, promoted himself as this kind of technocratic, super efficient um, person who was bringing all of the skills of business into uh, public administration. But what I do in the book is to show the fundamental irrationality of capitalism so that um, about a third of New York City was rezoned during Bloomberg's regime. So while he was talking about 
greening the city, you know, and he did do genuinely important things. He planted a million trees, which, which is important. You know, he made bicycle lanes. Great, we can all be for bicycle lanes, but building bicycle lanes and rezoning the city, so all of it in coastline areas that are uh, in those flood zones that you saw in the one map that I showed is kind of like um, an inconvenient truth where you hear about this disaster and at the end of the film you're told, well, you can just change your light bulbs, right? So, you know, the, the kind of fundamental contradiction there of talking a green game and developing the city in a way that put huge numbers of people in threat and also engaged in galloping gentrification because I show how the affordable housing which Bloomberg built was not really affordable. It was pegged to median income in the city, and so uh, you know, working class people just couldn't afford it, particularly working class people in the very communities where it was being built, like Long Island City um, and uh, uh, Williamsburg and other places which have been at the center of development. Um, so the book really tries to show how capitalism is developing in completely contradictory ways and uh, creating these imperiled cities, these kind of extreme cities, cities which are extreme economically, but which are also um, insights that make them targets of the forms of extreme weather, which climate change is uh, creating. So to the first gentleman who asked about um, market-based solutions, a lot of the book is really showing how those kinds of market-based solutions are really part of kind of greenwashing. You know, they're uh, a strategy that is completely contradictory and puts people um, in uh, the path of disaster both quotidian and, you know, the so-called natural disasters like Hurricane Sandy and Hurricane Maria. Um, as to what you said about market-based solutions in some of the things I presented, I think the situation is a little bit complex. I mean, I'm very critical of the Rebuild by Design initiative and the way, you know, the, the limitations of some of the, the, pro, uh, the proposals for development. Um, but I also want to show how there's been a, a long history of mobilization in New York City from grassroots communities so that some of the rebuild by design proposals, which came from a combination of foundation money, the Rockefeller Foundation and HUD, right, uh, the federal agency, really were changed, right? So you had these big architectural firms, engineers, et cetera, et cetera, really working at the behest of a state agency and a big foundation. And, you know, I know that Rockefeller Feller Foundation has all kinds of problems. You know, it comes from big oil and it is responsible for the green revolution in the third world, which is, you know, fossil based agriculture, one of the main things we need to confront today. Um, however, you can really see the pushback there. So I think we need to think kind of carefully, and I wouldn't say those are just purely market based solutions. I would say they're kind of mixed solutions with a kind of mix of somewhat utopian elements and highly problematic elements. Um, what I showed you in terms of, of the WE Act proposal, I think, um, is very much more um, grassroots, and it's not at all market-based. In fact, one of the elements, which I didn't really have time to go over, is the effort to think about ways of taking land off the market, right, in the WE Act proposal um, uh, through um, uh, various different measures um, in order to create public housing to, to protect what exists in New York, which is really significant, and to find new ways to socialize housing. Um, so I think that's all really important. In terms of the just transition question, you're right, it's a really, really hard, vexing question, and there's a horrible history there of people being force, forcibly displaced, and, you know, we can go back 500 years. This is a settler colonial culture, and we have a history of taking people off their land and, you know, uh, marching them uh, uh, in a kind of genocidal push into other places. And uh, what's happening in terms of cities today is just a continuation of that. Um, in the book, though, I do want to grapple with the fact that people are going to have to move. So how do we develop mechanisms that can give people some kind of a voice? Um, and I look at some proposals from indigenous communities in Alaska, like Shishmaref and anthropologists who've been working with those communities to find ways to put pressure on Alaska state, on the federal government, and on the Bureau of Indian Affairs to give communities a, a real genuine say over where they move, how they move, when they move, what the economic resources to support that move will be. Um, so I, I think it's important to have these con uh, kinds of conversations, as hard and painful as they may be, and as problematic as the history may be, because if progressives don't talk about this, it's going to be the right wing that dominates the conversation, kind of de facto. Uh, at least that's the argument I make.
Um, in terms of uh, the second question about population growth, um, well, first of all, urbanization, um, which is happening, uh, the predominant amount of it is in the global south, is one of the main ways that population numbers go down. Um, but I would say that the argument around population is something that we really, really need to resist strongly. It's a kind of Malthusian argument. The left, I think, has a history of resisting it um, for very good reasons, you know, of insisting that it's about the distribution of resources rather than you know, a sheer quantity of people, right? I mean, think about the fact that six billionaires have as m many economic assets as the bottom half of world population. If we could just take their resources and give it to the rest of the world, you know, it wouldn't be a problem to support them wherever they chose to, to live. And I think these kinds of arguments are particularly important to resist because, as I said at the very, very outset, there's a way in which our kind of increasingly catastrophic times can play be uh, kind of played on by a kind of green neo-fascism. That's not so much part of the discourse, my sense, uh, in the US at the moment, because we have a climate change denier um, in control of the federal government. But if you go pl to places like Phoenix and Arizona, um, it is part of the conversation. You, know, you have right-wing groups saying that this land only has a certain carrying capacity, and that's why we have to get rid of immigrants, right? So the kind of right-wing discourse is very much um, uh, emergent there. And if we look at the European Union, we can see uh, groups like the AfD, you know, the uh, neo-fascist party in Germany, which is bringing a version of Nazism back to Germany, making these kinds of Malthusian arguments. So I think we need to talk about reparations um, for climate change, you know, the fact that people in the global north have developed and have a quality of living that um, uh, has been based on a history of colonial exploitation and uneven development, um, that it's the global north that's responsible uh, disproportionately for climate change, both historically and in terms of current per capita to emissions, um, and that we have a responsibility to give harbor to climate refugees, um, uh, first and foremost, uh, in our cities, and of course, also to give the economic resources to global south societies so that they can make a fast, just transition to renewable energy. Um, and, you know, the international community has uh, agreed to those kinds of things. As neoliberal as the UN climate talks have been, there is a, a global um, a green kind of climate fund. It's just hardly any money, significant money has been put into it, right? So we really need to have a big push around these kinds of arguments. Um, and it, yeah, absolutely, um, in terms of what you're saying, Philip, it has to come from um, a, a real eco-socialist um, perspective and a very strong movement. And, you know, this, this book of mine comes out of the inspiration that I gleaned by going to the UN climate summits. Uh, I never actually got into any of the official venues because, you know, I'm not affiliated with anything other than a humble public university. But I was at the climate summits and there were these amazing mobilizations outside in counter summits by global civil society where I met folks like the um, indigenous environmental uh, group um, and trash pickers from Mumbai and you know many other civil society organizations who are making the kinds of arguments about climate justice reparations um, that I've been uh, trying to um, air in my book. Uh, so I think there's a very strong movement internationally, but we also are in a period of kind of uh, neo-fascism around the world or rising neo-fascism. So I think we really are again kind of faced with that question of socialism or barbarism and we have to fight very hard to make sure things don't go in a very, very dangerous direction as climate change makes situation more and more precarious for people around the world. Okay, um, that was a series of really interesting questions. Um, shall we break and um, I can sign books? Or would anybody else like to ask one last kind of burning question? Yes, okay. So um, <clears throat> I lived in Seattle all my life and they had a really great public transportation system back when I was a kid. And there were trolleys and uh, you, know, you didn't have to wait very long for a bus. And, you know, uh, I have an electric bicycle, <laughs> uh -huh. and, uh, you know, most of these events, you know, I can just ride my bike to. Uh, this one was a little bit farther away, but, you know, it's not just because, uh, you know, of the uh, energy savings and all that. It, what, what it really is is, uh, 
uh, it, it's getting to the point where driving is totally pointless, yeah. you know? And I'm really serious. And uh, I could get, you know, to most of these places at that time of the day faster on my bike, and I live quite a ways away from them. This was too far, but, you know, uh, than I could driving my car at uh, 5 o'clock, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm wondering... Um, well, what, it makes me wonder when that's going to dawn on people, that mm. it's pointless to drive. And not only that, you know, with all the displacement and everything, it just means people have to drive farther. And all those cars are just sitting there burning gas and pouring uh, carbon into the atmosphere. So uh, we have a very, supposedly, the greenest governor, and we have a nominally progressive city council and mayor and everything. But uh, I think we're kind of behind if you compare us to you know, other places like Northern Europe and stuff, what they're doing to get people out of their cars. Mm -hmm. So did you look into this a little bit? Yeah, um, I did, thank you. Um, before I answer that question, any other questions? Or should we call it a night with a response to that question? Okay, a couple more. All right, we'll take these two more. Yes. Um, yeah, I just, uh, listening to these things, I, you know, I hear, they're pretty substantial, right? Like some of the ones in New York, they're not going to happen like in a year, right? They're, they're probably talking a decade or it feels to me a lot like kind of rearranging deck turrets on the Titanic. Mm. Um, it seems like we need something larger than that. Like, you know, like you're saying about some kind of entire country change or, infra you know, change. And um, so, uh, you know, I just... I have trouble focusing on these things when it's like, well, yeah, but, you know, ocean acidification is going to kill off these things. When I talk about oysters, I'm like, I don't know if there'll be oysters and, you know, yeah. that can survive. I, I bring that up actually in the book. <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, things like that just make me wonder. And I guess the other thing is the places that aren't doing it right um, uh, are already, already leading to conflict. So there's a question of, yeah, we can talk about rebuilding cities and stuff, but if we're blowing each other up, what does it matter? Like, it, it's hard for me to keep hopeful, I mm -hmm. guess, without some really dramatic changes um, yeah. instead of little city here, city here kind of thing. Yeah, um, okay, thanks. Yeah. I was gonna piggyback on the transportation question, um, and specifically, um, you know, there's kind of a, a idea in the book that we shouldn't be rushing into places like Seattle and New York where, you know, there's a lot of affordability issues and just generally, like, how do you uh, fit more people in these places? But at the same time, there's a limited amount of American cities uh, with good tra transit. Um, so how do you, how do you um, decrease emissions um, in a kind of auto-based country that, you know, it, uh, I think of, like, Nashville, who earlier this month, you know, declined to invest in their transit system and it failed spectacularly um, and um, you know how do you is it is there a, is it like small cities need to improve their transit or is there kind of an imperative to um, grow in places that are, are uh, passively um, you know transit friendly mm. okay great thank you for those questions um, they're very important ones um, I think it's really important that the left makes arguments that offer people a hopeful future. And so they can't be purely arguments based on um, downsizing or abstention or, you know, sort of finger wagging uh, moralism about the amount of consumption that people engage in. Um, we need to be able to um, admit that the US is a product of 50 years of petroculture. You know, that the reason we don't have trams is because the big auto companies and oil companies connive to have them all ripped up and, you know, destroyed in the 1950s and spent a huge amount of time uh, advertising the benefits of suburbia to white middle income Americans and subsidizing that through um, uh, subsidized mortgages and the GI Bill, something that of course didn't extend to everybody in the population and even those who benefited, it broke down along uh, gender lines uh, in a way which for most women was not 
necessarily a great boon, right? Women who had been in the workforce in World War II were largely sort of pushed back into, into the house, middle class women at least. So um, there were definite uh, losses that were involved in the generation of the American way of life during the American century. And I think we can, we can talk about the ways in which the uh, system that we currently have, including the kind of mental outlook that we have, um, has not done right, either by all of us in terms of our ability to create vibrant social spaces and in terms of our possibility to live on the planet. Um, now, you know, how you get your local government to pr pass progressive policies of transportation, I think that kind of depends on, on the city and um, mobilizing coalitions of various different kinds. I mean, um, my experience really comes from New York where we're lucky to have a pretty strong public transportation system that didn't get ripped out during the post-war period, but it's also under threat um, and underfunded and uh, breaking down increasingly. So, you know, it's, it's a huge fight and it's a kind of political fight that we all have to engage in. Um, I would just say that um, while the reason not to do these things is often a kind of fiscal reason, like we don't have the money to support public transportation or to remake our entire infrastructure, um, History shows us that that's not true, right? I mean, if you look back to World War II, which is, you know, many people like Bill McKibben uh, are, have argued is a kind of um, example which can be quite useful in terms of thinking of uh, the kind of rapid transition that we need to have. Back in World War II, um, the auto plants in Detroit were switched from making cars to making bombers in one year, right? So we have experience of massive transformation of industrial infrastructures. Um, we can do that and we need to do that because the current crisis is one of uh, the lack of meaningful and decent employment for the vast majority of people in, in this country. I mean, we've got lots of employment, but it's bad and poorly paid employment, right? So. Um, uh, this goes back to what I was saying about the left should not just be some sort of hair shirt, you know, we need to give up things. We need to make arguments that connect with people in terms of the possibility for jobs and for better, more meaningful lives and forms of sociality. Um, and I think that's even more true in global south countries. Um, so the... Uh, place I come from, South Africa, recently had a plan put forward by labor unions called the One Million Climate Jobs Campaign. The idea was to recognize that South Africa has a, an economy based on extraction of gold and diamonds. It's failing, so the promise of ending apartheid really has not come through for the vast majority of South Africans who are economically worse off now than they were before the election of Mandela. Even though you know legal apartheid has been dismantled, people are struggling more than ever before. So if you acknowledge that the economic system is not working, what do you do? Well, you start talking about really shifting the economy completely to renewable energy and all of the jobs that can be produced by that. Um, and, and so I think we really need to push that and we need to acknowledge, going back to the, the first question, that this isn't going to be a market-led transition. I mean, I think one of the big arguments we need to make is that the market is not going to do it, right? Because right now, it seems within the, the country that climate change denial, which has been funded by big oil, of course, um, heinously, is our biggest problem. But if you look in more you know, progressive places um, or places that have a history of social democracy, even though there's kind of neo-fascism on the move today, like European Union countries, um, uh, denialism is not an issue. And the same corporations like Shell that have been funding denialism here are already talking about carbon taxes and market-based solutions as the way to go. So I think that the left has to start making much stronger arguments about a kind of state-led transition, a really rapid and massive state-led transition that can be a huge jobs program for people and you know really well-paying jobs um, to boot. Um, and th this has to be one that uh, is not led by some top-down state, 
along the lines of social democracy in previous decades, but one that really is driven by social movements. Um, now that might sound absolutely impossible to win, but there are places like um, Britain, for instance, where Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party is actually proposing things like this, right? You know, his party is driven by a radical social movement um, that has transformed it, and uh, he's talking about nationalizing the energy grid in order to completely change it to renewable energy. So, um, you know, he hasn't won power yet, but he got 40% of the vote last time there was a national election. He's not that far away. Um, and we should remember that Bernie Sanders had similar kinds of ideas in his platform. Um, uh, so, you know, there's, I think, a real sense of um, possibility in the air and that we really need to push it forward and have very ambitious proposals for the kind of rapid and relatively utopian transition that we want to see. Um, okay, I think we should probably wrap things up on that note. Thank you all very much.